Jamie, thanks for allowing me to record this session with you today uh, so that we can be shared with a broader audience. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And thank you for spending some time chatting with me. <laughs> I'm happy to do so. Before we launch into your questions and my attempt to answer them, can you share with our audience a little bit about your background and and then maybe you know, why is it that you would want to talk to me about this in particular and sure. what, what other uh, uh, folks have you talked with or done some research on the, the topics that we're going to get to today? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I've been in the learning and development space for quite a while now. It's I, I think it's 15 years at least. I'm not really keeping track, um, but it's been a while. Kind of like a lot of people I know fell into it a little bit by accident, um, but then got really hooked pretty quickly as well. Um, and I've worked uh, doing instructional design, some facilitation, some speaking here and there, and the, most recently at a couple of LMS companies. So that's given me a new perspective on the whole uh, space as well. But in the process of doing that and prepping some workshops, um, I came across some blog posts by David James, who obviously you know very well. And he mentioned uh, Carl Binder, and he was having you on some of his podcasts as well. So the two of you, uh, you and Carl, started coming into my view. Um, and then I, so I started digging deeper. And I started looking at some stuff on your website, on Carl's website, started listening a bit more to the podcast and always liking what I was hearing. Um, I think, as I mentioned to you briefly, it's, it's been kind of an ongoing frustration for me that it feels like in the learning and development space, we, we often um, miss this performance piece that you and Carl and David have been talking about quite a bit. And so this sort of, uh, I guess, tagline that you've attached to a mini series of the podcast, the kind of pivot to performance, um, I really like that. And it really resonated with me. So I thought I would, uh, I thought I would reach out because seem like a, a nice guy who's willing to share a lot of like your experience and knowledge and I'm a sponge right now so <laughs> that yeah well thank you for that uh yeah I found myself as the sponge for the first three or four years or so of my journey in what's now known as learning and development and uh I started in 1979 and I was immediately oriented to performance by the works of uh, the late Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert and Bob Mager and Joe Harless. Now, they're, none of them are, are with us any longer. Carl uh, Binder, who I've known for over 40 years, um, is one of the last guys standing like me. And there's, and there's you know, Judy Hale, which was in that series of uh, yep. with David James um, and many, many others, quite frankly, um, who are still practicing this. They're, nice. they're not maybe big on social media as perhaps I and Carl are, but uh, but I've known Carl for a long time. He comes from uh, the um, Tom Gilbert lineage. Uh, Carl was a former student of B.F. Skinner's, as was Tom Gilbert, and he kind of followed uh, Tom's uh, approach to things and language and such. I... Uh, was more of a discipline. Uh, uh, I followed the discipline of of Gary Rumler, the late Gary Rumler, who was a business partner of Tom Gilbert's in the late 60s to the late 70s. And in their materials, I've got workshop materials from 1972, where they use the, the phrase accomplishments mm. or outputs. Mm. And Gilbert always talked about worthy accomplishments was producing something of worth but it's about producing something yeah. and Rummler's language for that was output. So there's a lot of uh, similarities and, and slight differences between the way Carl Binder and I talk about this, but I think our orientation is to people. These are, this is my language for this. People are on the payroll to produce outputs yeah. that yeah. meet stakeholder requirements. Mm -hmm. And that gives you an outcome, a good outcome or a bad outcome. If you, you know, if you don't, meet their requirements, that's a bad outcome. You can meet, you know, the downstream customers requirements, but then the regulators may not be happy. And so, you know, that ain't no good. Yeah. Um, and the tasks are performed to produce those outputs and tasks are performed within a context. And you mentioned uh, in our prior exchange about uh, uh, 
the six box model, which is Carl Binder's version of Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. And there mm-hmm. are several other versions of this because people back in the 80s uh, also attempted to take Gilbert's stuff and his language, which was very academic, um, and make it more user friendly, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's a, several examples of this, and Carl's is really quite popular, the most popular of all of those iterations of the behavior engineering model. I myself uh, like to show the model on the prior page in Tom Gilbert's 1978 book, Human Competence, uh, because the page before the behavior engineering model, there was the model for incompetence. Mm. and. And that's the one I would show my clients first because they could then relate to that and get it, you know, have a laugh about yeah. that. Oh, yeah, we do that. Oh, yeah, we do that too. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's us all over. Then you flip the page and show them the behavior engineering model and you say, okay, this is what you need to put in place. These yeah. are the we, these are the things you need to think about yeah. because competence at any level um, is a, a, has many variables and knowledge and skills that we in instruction or training or learning address, you know, that's the stuff in our lane, so to speak. Um, That's not going to do any good at all if the rest of the variables aren't attended to. Uh, The late uh, W. Edwards Deming, the quality guru, um, talked about, you know, 94% of the problems are not due to the individual contributors, the individuals, the workers uh, as as an individual or team, it's due to the system. And management is in control of the system. And so if not, if that's, and he was a statistician famous for uh, helping Japan uh, crawl out of the, uh, the ashes of World War II and improve the quality of everything they made, uh, he and uh, Duran and other quality gurus, um, if it's true that it's the system, then we in learning and development, we can provide instruction or training or learning um, that helps people learn how to perform, Mm -hmm. to perform tasks, to produce outputs that'll meet stakeholder requirements. But if the environmental factors, which is one name for it, uh, aren't there adequately, if we don't have the right data or the right materials or the right mm-hmm. equipment mm-hmm. or the consequence system drives the wrong behaviors, mm-hmm. then then we're not going to get, you know, ideal performance, performance that meets stakeholder requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is this has been quite a, a an age old challenge. But but let's get to some of your specific questions here before I go on and on, because I can and often do. <laughs> no worries. Well, it's making me think of some uh, situations that I encountered over the last few years around like being asked to improve a training program or an onboarding program, for example, or create something for a certain situation. And then once I start to dig and ask questions, realizing that it doesn't matter how great my course is, how engaging it is, how, how frictionless, whatever, there was other things going on that we're going to create a problem. And then that started to worry me because I thought, okay, wait, so I'm going to like give this thing over to the client as like the external consultant, but it's still going to fail. And then I'm probably going to be the one that gets blamed for it. And so it was interesting at that time where I started to look into these other pieces and sometimes got a good reception, but often did not. Yeah. And so you know, I just kind of, whatever, left that in the background, um, but still do my questioning and my curiosity is there. I, I, I let it happen. But then I got to like the six boxes because that was a thing that was on David's blog post that I noticed. And I was like, oh, this these are the questions I dig into. I didn't know there was a name for all of this. Um, and then I looked at the behavior engineering model this week. Um, and I thought, well, like, I it, when I listened to Judy talk on the podcast too, I thought, I asked these questions. I look at the stuff. Like she mentioned you know, just even atmosphere and location and the office environment. Those are questions that I would ask as well. Like I've done a workshop before where the heat wasn't turned on in the middle of winter and people were freezing. I was like, I can't, this is not working. Like, I don't care what I say. They're not listening to me because they're so cold. (laughs) Like, this is So 
the the kind of the thing for me, I guess that we did I, I did mention to you um, before today is in those situations where these things came up. Like for example, I, I, I'm also giving an example. Um, there's a warehouse. There's people who work overnight on the floor. They pack skids. They get them on transport trucks, and then they get delivered to restaurants. Let's say coffee shops the next day. And of course, there can't be a lot of error, and there has to be some speed going on there. But these things are heavy. You know, they're big buckets of, let's say, pickles uh, for a place that serves burgers or something like that, and and maybe paper towels or whatever. But, you know, you, there's some safety that has to be in place there, but there's also some speed. So there was a, a, a an ask from this company to improve their onboarding because people would come in, they get a cohort of, let's say, 10 guys, and in less than two weeks after starting, they'd lose 70%. They'd lose seven of them. So the attrition rate was insane. So they're like, oh, this training is not working. I was like, well, mm, I, maybe it's not just the training. <laughs> so yeah. I started asking questions and I actually asked for permission to go on the floor of the warehouse and just observe and see what was going on. And one thing I learned was there was an incentive program. If you were packing this kids fast and you got done before your, let's say, eight, 10 hour shift was, was you got to go home early, but you still got paid. And then I said, well, this sounds like the only people that would be able to do that are people who have been there longer who know where the stuff is and how to do the job. And new people would never be able to do this. So if I was in the new cohort, I would feel like I'm never going to succeed at this. Yeah. But also then I asked, well, how many people are at home because of injury? Because they also had mentioned the high injury rate. Well, it's all their best people. But I was like, well, two plus two equals four here for me. Like you are incentivizing your best people to work really fast so they can go home early. And in the process, they are injuring themselves because they're not doing the lifting, et cetera, et cetera, correctly. So I was trying to get them to see that we could improve the onboarding, but it was the incentive program that I was seeing as the problem. And they didn't want to hear it. They had no yeah. interest in hearing it. So this is the thing that I mentioned to you is that when you start to dig into quote unquote, like six boxes or the behavior engineering model, where there are all of these other pieces involved, it is, I feel in my experience so far, uh, very difficult to convince the people who have, for example, hired you or that you're working for that all these other things need to be looked at too, or none of it's going to work. So yeah, I don't so know if there's a that, question there, but I, that, well, I, there's I, a, th so I'll, I can respond to that. I, one of the things that I learned from Rumler, and I had a chance to work with him as my consultant when I was an employee at Motorola back in 1981. And I actually came into the job one week early because he was going to be doing a one day workshop. And they knew that I was a fan of his and I'd been taught his stuff, a derivative of a derivative of his stuff, as it was put to me back in 79. But in 81... I tend to this and it's this is captured on a video as well. And he talked about the first thing that he looks at is the process. Is mm -hmm. there one? Mm -hmm. And and if there if there's not, well, that's the issue. If there is one, are people adhering to it? And yes or no is the answer. And if not, why not? And begin to look at that. He said, the next thing I look at is the consequence system and to see if that's in alignment with what management wants. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right on in that, you know, you can find that, yeah, the consequence system is often uh, not aligned. It just has evolved somehow. What No one was doing systems thinking when they put it in place to see that. But but as to why your clients may not be receptive to this, um, you know, so nobody likes to be pushed back on. You know, if they come to you with a request and they want you to help support them with some learning and development stuff, you know, they don't want to be told or challenged through questions that are either direct or somewhat oblique, but try to, you know, suggest that maybe they don't know what they're talking about asking for learning and maybe it's something else. You know, that's not the way to begin a relationship with a client. So uh, one of the things I learned is, you know, I refer to this as one of the sneaky tricks, but the sneaky trick is to <laughs> always say yes, take the order, insist on doing some level of analysis and the trick then is, well, that analysis data that comes back and tells them that they were wrong, that they should, they should attend to this rather than that, well, where did that come from? So I learned a long time ago that I had a, a client at Motorola who 
Uh, I was in a room with 20, uh, 20 of them manufacturing managers, and this was the top guy, and they had given me a request, and I had done my analysis and produced a report for them, an analysis report, and I handed out the 20 copies of it, and uh, he looked at the, looked at it in front of everybody, and he threw it across the room and said, this is no good. And he just looked at the cover. Well, on the cover, I put my sources, the names of all the people that I had used to conduct my analysis. And he didn't like several of the names on there because they were the what I started calling back then in 81. They were the friends of training. They were always available to help me and support me and all that stuff. But they had zero, less than zero credibility with my clients, the top of the middle management group there mm -hmm. in that particular client. So I learned a long time ago then to make sure that my sources, people, and documents, and if I was going to do observations, you know, where did I do those? That was all hand-picked, cherry-picked by my clients and stakeholders so that, one, it was a credible source. Mm -hmm. and, and, if, and if I didn't represent this as what I said, if I could represent it as, hey, you pointed me to these people and these sources and that, and here's what they say, and I've written it down just like they said it, didn't change the language in the mm -hmm. training or learning speak. Um, and, and so, you know, what are you going to do? Because, you know, I'm just the middleman here. I, I went out <laughs> and got this data from them. Here it is. Yeah. And this data pretty, pretty clearly says that the problems we have aren't caused by knowledge and skill deficits. They're caused by these other factors. Yep. Now, and then I could always play dumb and say, you know, hey, I don't know, maybe they all got together at breakfast and decided to lie to me. But this is pretty consistent across yeah. all the people yeah. that this is what they're saying. And so the validity and credibility of our analysis data has to be there. And it's best when they pick out those sources and you can attribute this data to this person or that person or this group of people. Now, I like working with groups of master performers um, and and other subject matter experts, not just subject matter experts who know a whole bunch of stuff about the performance or the topic or whatever, but master performers who know how to apply that, how to do the performance at a level of mastery, no kidding. And and because we want everybody to be like them, to emulate them, to perform at their levels or as close as we can get people to start growing in that direction and so I, uh, but, but, you know, this is funny because I had used Tom Gilbert's word exemplar when I said, mm -hmm. okay, I want to do analysis and we want to, I want you to identify the exemplars and the, and the head guy that threw across the binder. This was before the, I had done the analysis. He said, exemplars, guy, we hate that word speaking on behalf of 20 some people behind him, but you know, he was the head guy. So he could do that guy. We hate that word. That's a $3 college word. Now that means it's about a $30 college word today. And, he, and I just, out of the thin air, I pulled out, well, how about, uh, so you don't like exemplars, how about master performers? And he thought for a second or two and said, yeah, that'll work. So one, I learned that our language sometimes gets in our way in talking with the client because we speak in learning speak or performance speak and that's not their language and they don't no. really care to learn our language unless we've proven to them that it really, really works. And now they're intrigued and they want to know, Hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this, uh, you know, six boxes or behavior engineering model or whatever you call your approach, they'll be interested in that at some point. And yeah. if they never are, that's okay too, as long as they let you do it because you've proven that you can be successful, but mm -hmm. you got to be quick about it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, I think that, you know, so the, the getting clients to embrace this is one, don't rebuff anything. Do hear them out. Do your best active listening to make sure that you understand them. You don't need to teach them or tell them anything. You just want to make sure that you are crystal clear on what they're asking for and why. And now they know that you know because you're doing that active listening thing. And then... You can ask them, so who do I go to get the information to make sure this is good? Do we have anybody that's really superb at this, performing at the levels that you want everybody else to be like? Mm -hmm. And and let me, you know, talk with them individually or as a group. Now, I, again, prefer a group because they build on each other. They clarify each other. They fill in the, in the holes of what each other tells me. 
And then I try to capture that verbatim. Don't change the language. Um, one of the things that uh, Rumler and Gilbert used to do is that they would change the pattern of what they call their accomplishments. And let's see, was it verb, noun, or noun, verb? But reports produced. So noun, verb. Reports produced. Sales conducted you know and and so but not nobody that you talk to in the real world talks like that and so that's one of the things i learned to change <laughs> early on was whatever they call it write it down just like that yeah, and point yeah. it to that and say is this what you yeah, said yeah, and they yeah. go yeah 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 and if somebody else disagrees it goes well on the west coast we call it this that's the east coast version okay so that's the east coast what's the west coast version write it up there put a slash in between that don't try to negotiate to, to some language that again is unfamiliar to them and that way you've captured the voice of the master performers and the yeah. voice of other subject matter experts, because yeah. there may be somebody from <clears throat> regulatory affairs going, all right, wait a minute, you got to make sure that you meet this reg and that reg and this, you know, and so you need all these voices representing ideal performance and, and capture what they have. And then you can bring it back to your client and say, okay, we can do the training for you. This is where we get to what I call the L&D pivot point. At the end of the analysis, we take the analysis data to the client and stakeholders. And ideally, when they're in a group, rather than one on one, because that's, you know, somebody says something, you, you don't know if everybody else agrees with that or not. Or again, if it's a language semantics issue, but I take it back to them and I read it out. And I've had projects that were worth 100,000. I had a $900,000 project when the client saw the analysis data. They asked me to excuse myself and go to their cafeteria while they talked about this, what I had presented to them. So I said to them as a group, all right, you guys can see here that knowledge and skill deficits aren't the cause of really any of your performance problems, which is why we were doing this project in the first place. And uh, so it's okay with me if you decide, you know, you don't want to continue on because you need to put in what I understand you call critical action teams and and to have them tackle these issues and fix this because you've got broken processes, mm -hmm. you've got poor data, you've got uh, inadequate tools, and et cetera, et cetera. Here's all the data that I presented to them said that and and resonated with them. It was really nothing that they didn't know already. It's just that no one had assembled it in such a way that they could right. look at it and go, oh, that problem with that process or those people is really due to, hmm, the equipment is no good. And it's because, the and the people are saying why it's no good because it's not being properly maintained. Yep. Oh, we cut that budget last year. You know, and so they could all get their heads wrapped around the analysis data. It was in a language that they were familiar with. And then they, so I went to the cafeteria, they called me back a half hour, 45 minutes later and said, okay, uh, we're going to continue with the training project. And I said, well, okay, I'm happy to do that for you, but can you explain to me why? Because the reason we were doing this project was because you had these performance problems. He goes, well, we're going to expand uh, our operation here. We're going to hire a boatload of people and they need to learn how to do this stuff and what you've captured, they need to know. So we've got new hires coming in. So it's not just a problem with the current performance. It was, we've got new hires and they need to be trained. And so in parallel, we're going to fix our problems and you're going to put in this training for us. Mm. And then, yeah, when we fix the process or whatever, we're going to have to update the training and retrain everybody. But, you know, time's a waste and we don't have time to wait for us to fix these problems. And some of these problems, quite frankly, may be, uh, something that we can't solve not yeah. at you know the 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 cost to solve it is is not worth it given what the problem costs us in the first place so we can just live with some of these problems and and try to fix the ones that we can where that makes business sense but otherwise guy your data because this is part of, of what i learned from rumler capture the ideal performance you know what are the outputs how do you measure them what are the tasks what are the various roles and responsibility? Who's involved in task two? What are they doing? Who's involved in task three? What are they doing? And then do a gap analysis on the same page that shows where outputs don't meet the measures, yeah. the yeah. stakeholder requirements, and yeah. what the probable causes are, and whether those probable causes are due to a deficiency of the process, uh, the environmental factors, and then I take the human factors and divide them into two groups, 
knowledge and skills, because I'm a training guy coming in to do training and that addresses mm -hmm. knowledge and skills, but there's other mm -hmm. human attributes such as physical attributes, psychological mm -hmm. attributes, mm -hmm. intellectual attributes, and personal values. Mm -hmm. So, so I can differentiate, you know, maybe there are some things with the human, which would be best be solved by updating the recruiting and selection system and hiring yeah. the right people in the first place yeah. and then train them on what they got to do and put them into an environment where all the environmental factors are there adequately, not perfectly, but adequately to the needs of the process so that people can do that. But it's really difficult to get clients to accept that if they think that you're resisting it. I mean, you're in a support organization. Aren't you there to support us by doing this learning and development thing? Why are you coming at the very beginning and challenging us? See, I think that's the wrong, wrong, wrong thing. The thing to do is, you know, I spent three years in the Navy. I would salute and say, yes, I'm going to follow you. I understand exactly what you're talking about. This is what you've asked for and why, blah, blah, blah. My act of listening <clears throat> in a summary and say, I wasn't going to go do this. I wouldn't do this if I were you, but I'm going to go do it. All right, let's, uh, how do we start? Who do I talk to? Where do I go? Blah, blah, blah. And they go, what do you mean you wouldn't do it? And I say, well, I'm suspicious now based on some of the things you've said, but let's go find out because you've suggested things that sound to me like it's more of a consequence system issue or it's due to some other one of the variables. And, and you know, but let's go find out. Let's find out how your master performers are performing at a level of mastery despite any barriers. What are they doing and how can we get everybody else to do what they do. How can we figure out what are the behavioral tasks that they're performing that maybe others aren't? And what are more importantly are the cognitive tasks, the thinking that comes before, during, and after the behavioral tasks? You know, well, how do people need to think about these things here in order to perform? And then, you know, you might get into the fact that, well, new people aren't going to be performing at the same levels as a master who's been there for a while. And maybe you need to change the your consequence system and your reward system here so that people have a chance to kind of grow into that. But but I would rather that I captured those words from a master performer or other subject matter expert rather than it being guys' words you know, hey, I've looked at the whole situation here. Here's what I think. No, I try to never share what I think. Uh, unless until I've shared what their people think, because yes. who am I? What do I know about their business? How could I come in and figure out, you know, all the nuances of it all, you know, in a very short time in order to be able to challenge them or suggest to them that maybe what they're thinking about isn't the right way to think about this. I think that's a huge danger. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. And I think I like what you said that if you got the master performers together as a group versus individual, I think it's it's not just that they're building on each other and you're getting these different perspectives, but I think you're also able then to observe dynamics and culture. Yes. And 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 so yeah, you get the you get a sense, you know, master performers have egos. And, you know, it's, it was to the point where I would tell a group of master performers, OK, now when when John tells Barry, hey, you dummy, that's not what you're doing. This is what you're doing. What what John is really saying is that, Barry, have you considered that you might be actually doing this, but not actively thinking about it? You know, and they would all laugh because they were used to not taking any BS from anybody and, and not from each other, unless you were the absolute king of performance or queen of performance. And, you know, we all bowed down to you and took whatever you said as the gospel truth. Mm -hmm. And that may not be, you know, so one of the things I would talk with my groups about is that, you know, every time I run one of these analysis meetings and such, uh, I get other people who say, you know, in between tasks two and three there on the flip chart guy, yeah, there's actually four other tasks in between two and three. And and people, the person who gave me two and three would go look at them and go, what? You know, and and then they would say it's this and this and this and this. And I would write it down and then I turn to the group and say, is that right? And the person would go, Oh, yeah, that's right. i I I didn't think about, it. yeah, we, we actually we do those things. Yeah, yeah. And other people say, and that brings to mind these other things. And so one of the things that I learned early on is that. And I didn't have the language for this and didn't understand the science behind this, but but every time I'd review things, I'd get things added in. I'd get yeah. some corrections of, you know, omission of errors, but omissions of fact 
were uh, errors of omission were prevalent. You know, people would be adding into this. And uh, back in 2004, I think it was, maybe the earlier than that, Dr. Richard E. Clark talked to me about uh, the non-conscious nature of knowledge, automated knowledge. We've automated yeah. so many things that we just yeah. do them without thinking yeah. about them. And if you ask me about them, I can't tell you because I've automated them. So they're yeah. no longer uh, available to me to tell you but you and I, have, as experts, we know a different amount. And the research he's done is shares that experts can tell you 30% of what a novice needs. That means 70% is missing. So, yeah. but if he, if he talks to two of us, you have a different 30% than my 30%. So yeah. if we talk to enough people and he says five, six, seven is the number, um, then we're going. So if I get five, six, seven or 12 people in a room, I get pretty accurate stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. they're filling in for each other, especially when I've prompted them to do so and made it okay for them to do it, even if they were used to being gruff with each other, like, you dummy, don't you mean this? You know, and yeah, so yeah. they yeah. would laugh yeah. about that, but then they would do it, you know, and they would joke, you dummy. And but it would be a joke and it wouldn't be taken, you know, as a as an offensive thing. It was because Guy allowed them to joke about this as they corrected each other to make the data. It, it, you know, the data I found was always accurate and it was appropriate, but it was incomplete. And to get it more and more complete, they and I had to be open to having more added in. Each time we looked at it, each time we reviewed it with a new group, there'd be more to be added in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't t say to someone who's never rode a bike before, we'll just get on the bike and start pedaling. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's what we do because we've been doing it for years, but that doesn't mean it helps somebody who's never done that before. Yeah. And and that's that's what's really tricky. It's like uh, I've, I've been roller skating over the past like year and uh, I've been watching some YouTube videos to kind of learn how to get kind of going with that. And some people start at a point where they're missing probably the first five steps I need to know before I do the thing that they're showing me that yeah. they think is a beginner. And I'm like, I don't even know how you got to this point, though. Like, I need I need the steps before this. Yeah. And it's a perfect example of like automating just some of the stuff Like it becomes it becomes second nature to you. Right. You don't even think about it. Yeah. So it's it's almost impossible for you to explain it. And so it's funny, like every time I, I meet someone who's been roller skating for years, I am always hearing a different way to yeah. do something. And it's uh, it's so that every time I go to a rink, I'm always asking people who I can tell have been skating for years, like, you know, like if for some tips, because it's always different. It's always yeah. different. It is. I mean, it's, as a, as a, it, uh, parents who uh, train teenagers to drive their automobiles... <laughs> You know, where the stakes are pretty high because not just the car, but the kid and the light yeah, yeah, limb. And, yeah. and so, you know, you you pull out some of these things, but then you realize when they do something that you didn't tell them about exactly. that and you should have. Yeah. And uh, it helps bring some of these things. But some things are so deeply automated that you could, you, you know, Bob Mager used to joke, if you held a gun to their head, could they do it? If their life depended on it, well, you know, that's not PC, but but that's the truth. If Could they yeah. do it if their life depended on it? Well, yeah, but could they explain to you as if their life depended on it? The answer is no, they can't. No. No. That's the tacit knowledge that uh, that is not recoverable by that individual. Yeah, and then I think what I was also thinking when you were explaining that, too, is if, you know, there's you know, steps one to five, you know, like you said on the paper, but someone says, yeah, but between three and five, there's actually 10 more things. The thing that also pops into my head as an instructional design perspective is now, how am I going to build this so that this is not completely boring for someone new also where they're like, oh my God, how many steps are involved in this? And how long is this course? Because that's another struggle too, is we want to make it like, sort of engaging and interesting for the person to make it make sense, but we also can't skip things that are crucial. So I think that's a, that's also another part of it too, is is what needs to go in and have a, a, a you know 30 second video versus a two minute or what needs a little bit more explanation. I think that's our, our kind of second challenge after getting all that information back is like now this, this needs to be built out in a way that not just makes sense, but is consumable in a way that someone's not going to disengage with it halfway through. 
Um, exactly. So that's that's right. that's a piece too that I also think about. Yeah, there was a little bit of a delay there. Yeah. All right. So I've started the recording already. So I wouldn't forget to do that because that's happened to me with Will Tallheimer. I did this part two and I forgot to record it or thought I did, but it didn't start <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So that's uh, uh, interesting. So my take on this is that we spend way too much time in learning and development, trying to make things engaging. True. That if we really thought about what's the authentic performance requirements that people got to know how to do back on the job. If we attend to that, that should be engaging enough. And if it's not, maybe it's a recruiting and selection issue rather than yeah. a, a, yeah, I, a, I a agree. learning design issue. I agree. I, I think it's like I, 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 did, I did use the word engaging there, but like what I think sometimes is the weight, I guess, of certain parts of the process. Yeah. Um, like, for example, the the sort of let's say the, the roller skating example again, um, there's some parts of it that I really more important than others for me. Like for example, bending my knees and keeping my weight above my feet so that I don't fall backwards or forward. Like that is pretty important because I don't want to fall and hurt myself. Yeah. Like some other things, maybe not so big. So I guess it's sort so, sort of like the weight. And it's it's interesting how you say too that we spend so much time on the engagement. Cause I do believe this is something we used to talk about at Loop and we David would talk about this, but us our team as well, because we were often, not often, almost like I, I would say probably 80% of the time we were asked if we had gamification in the platform and we did not. And we would say we would, and then the next question would always be, well, is it on your roadmap? And then we would say it is not. And then of course, then the question would be like, why? And like, are you not going to do it? And we would say, no, we're not. Um, and so that, that's been an interesting piece for me when I, when I started designing learning and, and, and even interacting with it now is, we would our answer to people would be if you're giving something to somebody that's going to help them do their job well and efficiently you don't need the carrots and the sticks you don't need to dangle things in front of them to entice them to do your training and we used to say as well no one ever wakes up in the morning thinking i can't wait to get inside the lms today like nobody does this and so do i want someone spending more time in the lms playing games or do i want them to actually do their job um, so these were things that we kind of would would look at was like, I just want an answer that helps me do my job. I don't I don't need a game. I just need to get the answer. Yeah, if I have to uh, uh, repack a valve on an oil pipeline, I don't need a game about this. I need step by step instructions. Let me get on with it. But but so I think that, you know, the whole issue of game and I've used games built. I Mine were authentic simulations. And I did a thing with the product managers and have them run uh, product uh, uh, team meetings over the course of a life cycle. And I had five different products and there were five different phases of the life cycle and people would switch roles. So some, mm. at some point you'd be the product managers and at another point you'd be the sales team and you'd be the manufacturing engineering people and you'd be the design engineering people of Bell Labs and you'd be the support people who install things and all that stuff. And and so you'd, you'd participate in 25 meetings in one role or another, but five of those meetings, you were the product managers running the thing, getting everybody's agreement, calculating financials to see if our current plans are a financial dud or whether this would be acceptable or not. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. it's not acceptable, what, where are our issues that we would re mm -hmm. need to rework these things? Well, these groups became very, very competitive and they would cheat their financials <laughs> and then do a presentation at the end. And the other people would say, Hey, that's not the number I gave you. We're not selling a million of those at five bucks each. You know, no way. You know, you just change that arbitrarily. Well, they were so darn competitive with each other, as as the job kind of required you to be, uh, that they would cheat. And I said, the point of this is to calculate the financials and go and tell the group, these are no good. And this is what we got to work on. We got to work on this and this and this and fix these financials, not yeah. gain the financials, yeah. Yeah. you know, <laughs> but, but so... So I think when people are in learning how to perform their jobs, you can construct things in such a way that that you can make it somewhat of a game, a competition to get better and better and better. And 
but but you know it's one of those things where you have to be very careful about that because some people come into a learning experience and they've got you know oodles of years of experience and other people are novices just fell off the turnip truck and come into the into the learning experience and don't know anything and and you can where... destroy somebody yeah yeah with the competitive thing so i learned yeah. to pair people the the least experienced with the most experienced and pair them yeah. And that way, the least experienced person had somebody to lean on. And then I would tell the person with the most experience, don't take over and run the whole thing here. Help them learn how to do what you already know how to do. That's your job is to be do my job as the facilitator yeah. uh, in an instructor led uh, training uh, situation. Um, but but so we we can do that. And I think that there's a lot of things about the gamification thing that are overkill. And most of the time we're using engagement scores as a proxy for uh, measured results back on the job. Since we don't know what the job was, we just know that here's a topic. It's got face validity. Of course, they need to know this in order to perform. But we never teach them how to apply that in their performance. We just talk about that, that topic, that knowledge, that skill in isolation, that behavior, that competency, mm -hmm. you know, it's the whole skills mm -hmm. media nowadays. Skills, behaviors, competencies, knowledge, topics out of context don't easily, readily transfer back to the job. Therefore, they're not going to have a, a positive impact on performance. It's nope. simply going to be a negative cost with yep. no return or a nil return on that investment. And so because we we try to do one size fits all, take a topic. Oh yeah, everybody needs that and and spread it around generically because we can't teach how to apply this because there's too many different applications and that would cost too much to put that together. So we give this one size thing, which is education, which there's nothing wrong with education except in an enterprise. If we give people education and not training, eventually it may be effective but it'll never be efficient in getting to that effectiveness. Yeah. And, and so we are in a different position when we're doing enterprise learning and development and that we can focus on the terminal performance as it used to be called and understand what do you got to know to be able to do and how is all of that measured? What are the stakeholder requirements for that output? What are the stakeholder requirements for our task performance? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the, the regulators, they care about how you did it. They don't care what you produced. Other regulators care about what you produced. They don't care how you did it. And yeah. other regulators care about both. So you need to understand all of that so that people can perform successfully in their jobs. And that means we've got to take a look at and start with the terminal performance and then derive, you know, what do you got to uh, do? And then what do you got to know to be able to do to produce that? Rather than starting way upstream going, hey, here's a skill. Everybody needs this. Of course, of course. And, and let's focus on packaging that. And then we wonder about why we can't measure performance. Well, it was because <laughs> we didn't know what the performance was in the first place. We took an enabler and decided to focus on that rather than on where do people use this? How do people use this? What are the variances? Is it always that way? Are you always a good cop or sometimes you a bad cop or sometimes you you play both roles? Yeah. You know, and so we we that's and this is an age old issue. Mm -hmm. This goes back into the 1960s, uh, at least in the professional circles that I ran around in back in those days. Yeah, it's a measurement piece that I've always um, <clears throat> wondered about. Uh, like I, I think, like I mentioned to you, the the sort of the learning and development space has frustrated me for a long time, almost since I started in it. Well, you've joined uh, a club. There's a big and, yeah. club. <laughs> There's a <clears throat> club. Those are the people who are self aware that what we're doing ain't working too well. Uh, but not I, everybody I, is in that club that's in the <laughs> field. But go ahead. And I jumped out of it for a while because I got so frustrated. I kept going to conferences and just hearing the same old thing: we don't have a seat at the table, and our budgets are cut, and our team is sh blah 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 blah. I was like, well what, well, what are you doing <laughs> like to make an impact? But I remember there were times when, um, like, because at Loop, I was I was selling the LMS. Like, I was I was in sales, and, and I would be on calls with people and, like, learning and development teams for pretty sizable companies. And I won't mention names. And I would ask them pretty early on in the discovery part of the call because I want to know if we're a fit. 
like, how are you going to measure the stuff that you're going to do inside our platform? Like, what is going to matter and what is going to make a difference? What are you going to focus on? And I would often not get an answer. And I would often also get like kind of a, like you said, like a rebuttal where it's like, why does that matter? We just want to see features, et cetera. But I remember there was one group that surprised me. They actually said, you know what? We need to go away and rethink this process of buying an LMS and figure out some things that we haven't got answers for for you in this call. Like we have not thought enough about measurement. We have not thought enough about impact. We have not thought enough about this stuff. And that person could see that they were then going to spend thousands on a platform that was not going to prove its value. And so they did. They went away and they actually looked at how they would answer my questions. And then they came back and did like the second call with those answers. And I was like, wow, I wish like, I wish more people would do this. So, because... so Richard, Richard E. Clark, who I mentioned earlier, who's a professor emeritus at from Southern California University and one of the gurus in the field, he talked about the non-conscious nature of knowledge, the automatic, he, back in 1983, he wrote a, a paper and and I'm going to mangle this a little bit, but he says, you know, you don't improve the nutrition of the food that you order by the delivery truck. You know, one delivery truck over another is not going to improve the nutrition of the food. And so these the the tool mania, the fascination, the shiny object thing we have with all sorts of tools, the tools that help us do our work, um, uh, administrate our work, deploy our work. Those are just tools. If they're not, if they don't have the right, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, or good yeah. stuff in, good stuff out. Yeah. And so, you know, what I learned is that, you know, analysis is so critical, but there are steps before analysis. It's like, you know, your your skating thing. There's there's steps before that. There's there's the project plan to make sure that we do this right and get the right people involved at the right time, minimize the burden on them and produce good stuff. And then there's the intake process before the project planning process. And before the intake process, there's probably uh, client and stakeholder relations, you yeah. know, explaining, you know, who we are, what we do, how we do it, why we do it this way versus some other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, despite, you know, how we've been doing it in the past year, we're doing going to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. We're going to focus on performance and not on the upstream enablers, knowledge, skills, et cetera. Um, may take a little bit longer because we're actually going to do some analysis and figure things out. Um, we're going to run our business like the rest of our business is running itself, you know, thoughtful, planful, you know, and measuring things. And what we need to measure is when we train somebody, when we give them some learning that they can now perform better and faster and cheaper. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing? Well, if you're a script writer, you're producing scripts. If you're producing storyboards, that's another thing. If you're producing videos, if you're producing widgets, if you're producing financial reports, if you're producing sales, you know, we can count those things. And mm -hmm. so we need to look for the things that are countable. You know, we've made more decisions. We've been more innovative. You know, those are things that we can actually measure and count. And Carl Binder is big on this. And so I encourage everybody to kind of, you know, if they're not following Carl's work, they need to. Um, and, and, and focus on those things. Begin with the end in mind not the means to the end, but begin with the end. And for him, he I think he calls his stuff work outputs. I've been calling yeah. it outputts, you know, yeah. forever, uh, going yeah. back into you know, 1979. But, but so the outputs are the thing where you start. People yeah. are there to produce what? Okay, you bring to me, uh, so when I have clients come to me with a request and they give me some topic as an example, I may do my best active listening, understand what they think about the topic, why they want to do this, who's it for. I would try to shift the conversation, segue or pivot to performance by asking them at some point, at the right point, not too soon, but what would authentic practice with feedback look like? Mm -hmm. If they were taking this topic, this thing, and using it in their jobs, and we wanted them to practice using it so they could, you know, start off kind of good, then get better and better and better, you know, what would that look like? What What's that application look like? Because that if you practice, if you have authentic practice with feedback, that's performance. Yeah. And so I can take whatever they give me 
and try to convert it into from a performance orientation without being challenging. And that's some, uh, something that doesn't challenge them at all. They can go, oh, yeah, you're asking me what would that practice? I can tell you, or they, or they might say, well, given the target audience, which is everybody under the sun, uh, there's way too many of those kinds of things. I said, but, but what would that be? Yeah. Pick a couple examples. <clears throat> yeah. Because if we want things to transfer and have impact, we better focus on that because if we don't, if we don't show people how to apply what it is we want them to learn, they're not necessarily going to be able to apply it. Now, Dick Clark, Richard Clark, uh, had told me 20 some years ago that between five to 15% of people can learn out of context and figure out how to apply something that they learned out of context mm. into new context. Mm. And that means 85% of the people can't. Mm-hmm. And I've always guessed that it was my clients were the were in that five to fifteen percent. Oh yeah, you just teach them this and they'll be able to figure it out because you know I do. And but that's not necessarily true. <laughs> we're projecting ourselves onto everybody else and then wondering why they're not as good as we are. But but so we need to help people with near transfer content, which means if you want to teach somebody to play piano, don't teach them the trumpet. <laughs> teach them the piano or maybe an accordion. Or something that's darn close with yeah, keys yeah, that they, yeah. you know, and so <laughs> that's, we need to get things, doesn't have to always be perfect. We can get it close enough that they can go, oh, yeah, I can see exactly how I can apply that. The, the practice exercises don't have to be perfectly authentic, because if they did have to be, then we would have them do real work yeah. rather than some ver- simulated version of real work. Yeah. And we'd have them doing things rather than knowing things rather than recognizing things for a quiz, uh, multiple choice, or recalling things with fill in the blank. We'd want them to take the stuff that they could uh, recall and recognize and apply it. Because that's the acid test is, can they apply this in our learning experience? And then we have greater confidence that they'll take it back to the job. Now, just because it could transfer doesn't mean it would, because the supervisor might say, guy, you've learned that newfangled way of doing things. I'm an old fangled kind of guy. You yeah. got to do it the way I was raised yeah. to do this here in the company yeah. 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, forget what they I said. I can manage it. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't, we didn't do the analysis to look at what's that performance context that the learner is going to go back to their job, their world, and what could possibly be a barrier? Will it be supervisors? who are fearful that guy will screw things up and they don't know how to manage guy because he's doing this, this new way different than how it's been done in the past. Maybe we needed to do something for the supervisor as well. And maybe the peers that guys guy works with need to understand that guy's been taught this newfangled way of doing something and we need to help them. Otherwise they become part of the barriers. Maybe it's not the physical environment. Maybe it's the people that are there in the performance Mm -hmm. context Mm -hmm. And we need to give thought to this. So I would used to ask my clients, you know, hey, how are the supervisor, you know, so I can create this learning content, this training content, and we can train everybody and get them to learn it and prove it in the classroom. They go back to the job. And if the supervisor stops it, that's on you guys, because you own the supervisors. They report to you, not to me. And so could that happen? Do we need to worry about that? And if we're dealing with, with content that addresses high stakes performance, high risk, high reward, then it behooves the client and the stakeholders to think, oh, yeah, we can't have that happen. We can't have those supervisors stop that. What do, what can we do? Well, we can train the supervisors on what's coming and why yeah. and give them a role to play in helping Guy come back to the job, give them a checklist so that they can see the guy's doing it this and he's doing that and then he's doing this and there's some couple new things in here, but I know how to manage it from a checklist perspective to see if he's actually doing it. And I can reinforce what guy's doing and I can extinguish it if he's taking shortcuts that he shouldn't be taking. Mm-hmm. But if mm-hmm. it's high risk, high reward stuff, then yeah, we can do that. But if it's you know low risk, low reward or zero risk, zero reward, and we've got some packaged content, then nobody really gives a hoot anyway. And I would say, you know, if I have to do it politically, just do it and be done with it and move on. Don't die on that hill because it's not worth it. Because yeah. um, it proves nothing to to anybody that of, of the value that we can provide. But, you know, I can salute and do your bidding. 
but there's places, times and places where I mean, you want to make a stand for that performance orientation, for that performance impact that we could potentially have. Oh yeah, totally. It's interesting too, like there's so much of what you're saying around, you know, authentic practice, for example, and then that feedback where, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but well, actually I don't, but it, it, it cannot live in an LMS and it does not need to. Um, no, you know, I mean, uh, the LMS can deploy that kind of content to me, the learner, to you, my supervisor, <laughs> and you can keep track of things and, you know, depending on the LMS, you, you know, you can say that guy has successfully completed this after one month and after three months. Yeah, again, he's still doing it or whatever we need to use to administrate. We can deploy content. We can administrate it, see who's completed it and not, including the supervisor and their role in this. I, I had the client... Uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, Eli Lilly, um, and they didn't allow any of their vendors to create training if it didn't have a piece for the supervisor. They mm. got it. They said, oh, you got that for the learners here? Yeah, What's what do you got for the supervisor? So it was part of the RFQ that, you know, you have to do something for this particular target yeah. audience and for their supervisors. Yeah. Something, a briefing package, maybe they needed, maybe... Maybe all they needed to be, uh, all that was needed was for them to be aware, or they mm -hmm. had to have some new knowledge, or mm -hmm. they too had to have a new skill uh, and be able to apply it. And maybe there was even testing of them, because mm -hmm. if it's really high stakes performance, we can't have, you know, uh, you know, you can't have it all go to pieces because the supervisor didn't do their thing. Maybe just the the, the kind of training that was needed for the learner, the performers was also necessary for the supervisors. Yeah. And maybe the middle management had to be clued in too, so they didn't yeah. wander in and manage by walking around and stop things and get it to be done the way they know how it's supposed to be done. Maybe we need to clue them in too. Yeah, because I think what happens, like it's happened to me in a previous role, is we knew more than our managers did. And so we started to get frustrated. Yeah. Because we, we were kind of... And what happens is kind of like that inmates running the asylum thing because we were just like, we're just going to do this and ignore you because you don't know what you're talking about because we figured this out. You've been too far removed from this for too long. And uh, what you're telling us doesn't work on the ground, you know. Right, right. And I remember that was really frustrating. And then, of course, you start to get resentment. You start to get it, like actually like almost battles happening between people because the managers were kind of show up in the middle of chaos and say this yeah. and they'd redirect people based on what they knew and they you know so and, if you were a manager and you have five different job titles reporting to you and and you're two or three levels up you came up through some of those but not all of those no. yeah. so you understood the jobs that you had back in the day as they were done back in the day and not necessarily today but then you are pretty much blind yep uh and unknowledgeable about any uh, thing not just the nuanced levels but the overt stuff and how to manage that because you came up a certain path in this pyramid and and you don't know these other jobs well enough but yet you're in charge of the ultimate results of you and your people and your budget and your equipment and whatever else you've been given to get the job done and so we too often you know the management leadership training and development kinds of stuff doesn't go after and help them figure out to either tell them or give them the tools and knowledge and skills themselves so, so that they can go map their own processes to figure out who's doing what and where are the key critical points in those processes that I need to have measurement data mm -hmm. so that I can predict failure before it happens and recover soon enough before, you know, it's too late. Um, and there's been movements in the past by uh, of people that I know from my professional association that's that really tried to focus on what are we doing for managers? You know, we've learned this performance technology and shouldn't we teach this to managers? You know, shouldn't, rather than make everybody dependent on us in the learning organization, yeah. uh, in the learning department, uh, that we know this performance technology, technology being the application of science yeah. and not digital computer stuff, but, but shouldn't we teach everybody to how to do this themselves, how to look at this themselves, maybe work ourselves out of a job, if you will. 
you know, which is scary to too many people. But but basically, we need everybody to be focused on performance. That's what managers' jobs are. We are there to support managers in making <coughs> performance happen. We aren't responsible for performance. They are. We are responsible for providing the kinds of enablers, uh, performance guides and learning experiences or job aids and and uh, um, training or resources and courses, whatever language you want to use for that. We provide that kind of stuff, but we don't set the consequence system up and manage it and change it if it needs to be. We don't define the processes that people work in. But while we're doing our analysis, we can certainly help our clients begin to understand what's going on down at the ground level in that process level and whether there's issues that they need to attend to that are outside of our outside of our lane. We, you know, we may be able to help them uncover those things. We may not be in a position to fix them. And sometimes people in L&D don't want to get into that because, well, if I point out a problem, I'm expected to fix it. And I don't know any of that. I'm not a process engineer. I'm not a software engineer, you know. And so, but we need to figure out how to collaborate with the other functions in our enterprises to help them to work together to make the process, the workflow or what the quality world called work streams, different language for all these things, to perform better, faster, and cheaper, because that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, not sure how uh, much longer you want to go here. Um, I see it's we've been for an hour, so maybe we can uh, um, continue on another time. I really enjoyed it, though. There's lots to chew on, though, guy. Oh, my God. Like... There's so much. This is the one thing that I mentioned to you over email. Like, this is a huge piece for me to dig into. Yeah. Um, like the the people that you've mentioned, um, I've got one of the, the I've got the human performance book actually right here, um, and I'm starting to dig into all this stuff. But it is it is really big, um, and at the same time, I feel sometimes it's not either because some of the the questions are not that complicated. It's just can you slow down and do you have the patience and the willingness to actually just look at this? And then once you see, like you've said, once you see and you have that 20 page thing put in front of you, are you willing to look at it or just throw it across the room? Like sometimes I think that is that is a, a almost sometimes a larger part of it than just, the, for example, the six boxes. It's the willingness to dig into all of them, to take the time, to have the patience, looking in the to look in the mirror because I think that's part of it, too. Um, and and. I, I think it's a it's a very interesting thing that you've said a couple of times that I have have sort of gone down this road too where I say done is better than perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be a little bit better if possible. And then when you see what better is and things start to you know go a little bit more efficiently or whatever, then oh okay, let's do more of this and let's do a little yeah. bit more of this. It doesn't have to be solve it all right now. Like don't get maybe don't get rid of that incentive program right now on the warehouse floor, but be aware of the consequences of paying people to work faster and then bust their backs and <laughs> go off on injury, right? Like at least be willing to think about it, maybe not change it right away. Because there was other pieces too, where for example, the, the aisles between the shelves were too narrow to allow people to lift properly the way that they were being trained to lift. So I was like, well, this is a problem too. Like I just watched your training. Now I'm on the floor and I see that it's impossible to do what you just trained me to do because there's not enough space for me to bend my knees and do the correct pivot. So yeah. what's the point? So the thing is, it's not, you can't like redesign and rejig the entire warehouse overnight and do all these things. Exactly. But, but where are some of the things, the kind of quick wins where some of the stuff where we can start to see a bit of a difference and then notice that difference and go, okay, this is working. What else can we do now? Oh, now this is the other thing that I mentioned, like, you know, a couple months ago, let's dig into this now. So that's, that's part of it for me is it's not just the good questions and the perspective and the behavior engineering model or the six boxes or the outputs, but are all of these people involved willing to go down this road with you? Yeah. Um, I, and I think that one of the things, if you ask the kinds of questions that aren't challenging, but, you know, the inquisitive questions that help you, you establish a consensus around what's at stake. Is this high risks and mm -hmm. high rewards? 
which are the flip sides of the same coin. If you yeah, don't avoid yeah. that risk, you know, that's a huge reward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not, not going to be paying out fines or whatever. But but so if but so, and that's the word of focus. That's where to get really serious about trying to do as complete a job as possible. But my first boss back in 1979 said after our first project, I guess I was I, I thought uh, we didn't really get everything that we wanted and we could have, and we should have. And, and she told me, guy, don't be such a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. If we make a 10% improvement here, that's huge across our entire company for yeah. all the people that we could affect. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. So let's be okay with 10% and not demanding that we do a hundred percent because there were too many things that would have been too costly it would have taken a fortune and a lot of time to change. And yeah. so we got the things changed that we could do fairly easily, fairly quickly, and and at much less expense. But we've got the executives that we were working for understanding what we can bring to the party. While we're looking at what the training requirements might be, the performance-based training requirements, we can help uncover these other issues or opportunities or problems that they need to attend to. And, you know, we can help them to whatever capability we have, but we're not always the leaders of that solution. Right. And so we can work with those, with other groups and not try to take over, but try to be a team player and help them and have them be able to question and challenge us about our data and where to come from, who said that, you know, and, you know, we need to provide it because they're going to question it if they come in late to the game and see our data and want to know, well, is it, is it valid? Is it credible? And, and, you know, I think those two things are, are really critical that, you know, you can have data and it can look valid, but is it really credible? I mean, who, where does it come from? Who's saying that if it's you guys saying that, what do you know about our world? And so, no, we talk to your people. <laughs> like gaming, and, like gaming and, financials. And, and this person, that person, this person. Oh, they're your best people. Okay, so so there may be something to that. Yeah. Um, but it's really, you know, how to be a, a collaborative team player focused on the ends and then taking into consideration the means, the various means that we can use and then using the Pareto principle. Because if we can get, you know, 80% of the benefit by focusing on 20% of all the things, all the dials and knobs that we can tune and twist. You know, if we can get 80% of the improvement through 20% of dealing with 20% of the factors, then that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be going for 100% because there's the law of diminishing returns. And we don't need to have perfection or zero defect, which, you know, is impossible anyway. Yeah, I like to think sometimes uh, I, I keep the phrase in mind, uh, what's the lead bowling pin that's going to knock all the other ones down? Yep. yep. Um, that's that's how, often how I like to think of it as well. And I ask that question to people sometimes, too, is like, what's the thing that if we get this going is going to trigger all the other things that we need to happen to? Yeah. And sometimes there is an answer and sometimes they're not. But it's worth, I think, looking at um, no. sometimes to kind of see, like you said, like, where's that 20 percent or where's that first focus? That will make the next bits that we are already kind of seeing um, happen. So, yeah. yeah, but this is great. This well, is so well great. one of your questions here was, you know, you had a concern about putting your name to this kind of performance-based work. Oh, yes, I did. And I don't think you need to change too much other than talk about your performance orientation or being performance-based is the language that I grew up with. And, and, but... But but look for you know if you're if you're the organizations you're working with are really invested in total quality management or whatever, borrow some of the language from from them the functions that you're working with or the prevailing thing with the customer. But but I don't think that you need to you know I I would say I do performance based training or and I've come around to instruction because training is one thing learning experiences is similar in my view. Performance guides, job aids, performance support, you know, those kinds of things, electronic performance support systems, that ain't training. Those aren't learning experiences. Those are follow a checklist to follow and, and build a, a bookshelf. That's not training. It's instruction, though. It's instructional. So I think the term instruction it includes both performance guides, job aids, kinds of things, and training or learning experiences. And to me, 
I don't want to be pinned into, you know, learning experiences. I want it to be performance-based learning experiences, but I also want to, but suggest that, that we could do, we could impact performance a lot greater at less expense by providing people with guidance, what Rumler and Gilbert called guidance back in, uh, I was given on my first a day on the job, a newsletter from 1970 on guidance, which then was was more popularly known in 79 as job aids, but now performance support or quick reference guides, all this different language for these things. People can just simply follow that. And if they have the right prior knowledge and skills already, mm-hmm. like how to read and how to recognize certain things, that may be all that's needed. We mm-hmm. don't need them to memorize that unless the job context itself, the performance context demands a memorized response because there ain't no time to re- reference anything. Otherwise, we can give people reference materials and guide their performance and have them perform successfully without requiring that they memorize all sorts of things that they can't possibly keep in memory yeah. for recall purposes yeah. unless then- they're doing it every day, all day long. And and then, yeah. you know, we can give them that kind of guidance and then they can use that guidance until day three, they no longer need it because they've mastered yeah. it. They've memorized it. Yeah. And then give them a multiple choice question just to make sure they memorized it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, so my preference has always been, can they perform on the job? That's And if they can't, then we can figure out, okay, they didn't memorize it sufficiently. Anyway, uh, we've we've uh, had a fun time here, I think, and I yeah, thank you yeah. for allowing me to record this. And uh, yeah, same. Um, where can people find you out there in the uh, internet? I spend most of the time on LinkedIn these days. I still have a Twitter account, but uh, Twitter is not the same as it used to be. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, LinkedIn is where I spend most of my time and I find where the good conversations are happening is where I've been seeing your stuff, for example, over the last few months and what triggered me to reach out to you. So yeah, just, uh, looking for me there. I think, I don't know the URL off by heart, but if you search Jamie Good, I'm pretty sure you'll find me. Oh, well, I'll put that in the show notes here in this uh, YouTube video that we're going to produce. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie, uh, for your for uh, inviting me to chat with you about all these things, because uh, I'm very passionate about this here. And I'm uh, I'm turning 71 years old next month. And so I'm really mostly retired, but uh, but I still have passion for this. And I want to help Thanks. people climb that learning and performance curve and start uh, taking a performance orientation to learning and development and things that go beyond instruction. Awesome. Well, this is a great chat, Guy. It was great meeting you. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah, see you.